Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces Part 1, Stratton Dreams Book 1, Desolation's Tears Read by the author Chapter 3, Out on the Ice 1 Against the backdrop of Desolation's vast polar regions, the Comfed military transport traversed the snow-illuminated darkness like a parasite on the scalp of the world. The steady rumble of the transport's tread crunching over the snow at 50 kilometers an hour was rhythmic and soothing. Only no one aboard had dared allow themselves even a moment's nap. Twelve minutes before arriving at their destination, Lieutenant Drexler cleared his throat to get his squad's attention. <clears throat> Listen up. We're still ten clicks from our rendezvous with the advanced scouts that called this in. Their last check-in confirmed the site remains cold, but it's still dirty. Cleanup isn't our job, and I'd rather not heat this up if we don't have to. He paused and sighed as if lost in his own words. Talitha read between the lines. The details she had been brought here to record had started and finished long before the two hapless flash cops had been dispatched to rouse her from her bed. Whatever had happened had been picked up on the sensors and scouts were dispatched. It was over by the time they'd arrived. But whatever they'd found was deemed worthy of a heavily armed Comfed Flash Guard assault unit and armored transport. The mystery deepened, and they were still over ten minutes and less than ten kilometers from the answer. Drexler regained his assertive demeanor. Dawn will be up on us soon, and I'd really like to have this situation contained before sundown. There were various ascents offered, which further encouraged the lieutenant that his faith in his unit was well-founded. Talitha recognized he'd reward them to the best of his ability once all this had wrapped up. Now, I don't want to spend another night out in this shikehole Sub-Zero, and neither do any of you. He raised his voice so it resounded off the armored interior. Am I understood? His squad seemingly absorbed his passion. Sir, yes sir, they affirmed in unison, as if this was just another step they played in the communal ritual of the mission. Drexler looked at Talitha and doubled down on his perpetual scowl. And that goes double for you, masters, he said, revealing how this face was just a front. This time, Talitha met his scowl with a half-grin to suggest she was onto his professional game. Sir, yes sir, she said, repeating the phrase uttered by the others under his charge. Lieutenant Drexler smiled for the first time. 2. The armored transport stopped 20 meters from the object in the ice. Metal a human-made construct approximately seven meters around at its widest circumference, partially embedded in the snow after landing and skidding across over a hundred meters of frozen surface, creating a slick runway of refrozen ice in its wake that perfectly marked the course of its landing. It had obviously come in hot and fast from an atmospheric entry. On approach, Talitha had watched as the cockpit gunner trained every weapon the transport had on the tiny speck of dark set against the light gray horizon of seemingly endless frozen wastes. With the gunner's assessment of their target site finished, and a wave from the two scouts next to their hoverbikes, keeping an equally safe distance from the downed object, Lieutenant Drexler gave the order and the sergeant opened the rear hatch. The rearmost pair of flash guard exited one after the other, each taking up position on either side of the hatch to provide cover fire if necessary. They were followed by the pair carrying crowd pleasers, each stopping near the rear just long enough to accept their backpacks of ammunition. 
100,500K nanometer caliber micro shells per pack, and affix them to their torsos with the touch of a button. Only now did Talitha register that the entire ceiling length of the transport's crew bay was lined with two tracks of ten backpacks. Two million paydays, with the capacity to render the interior of the armored transport into a death trap. An unlikely event, but Talitha found herself unexpectedly anxious for her turn to disembark. Row by row, the flash guards disembarked with practiced precision, forming dual four-guard units led by twin crowd-pleasers, ready to flank outward from either side of the transport. The sergeant was next, followed by Drexler, then Talitha. The driver remained behind with the gunner to keep the transport and its heavier weaponry mobile. It was colder here without the structures of redemption and the towering hulks that filled the land barge district to cut the wind. But Talitha still didn't mind. She didn't actually need the goggles she came with, but it was always best to keep up appearances. With a nod from the lieutenant and twin hand signals from the sergeant, the two half-squads spread out from the front of the transport to secure an encircling perimeter around the crash site. Despite the deep chill, the body language of the two scouts conveyed relief at their arrival. The ring of flash guards spread out, maintaining a 10-meter buffer between them and any potential surprises the unknown object might still have in store. With confirmation of a secure perimeter, each flash guard spaced out evenly so as not to catch another in any sudden crossfire. The two scouts approached the transport. Their salutes to Drexler's superior rank were awkward, no doubt from having spent the last several hours in the deep winter cold. We are surely glad to see you, the first scout babbled, forgetting the formal sir that his own rank required he include. Sir, added his partner quickly. Drexler ignored the breach in etiquette and turned to Talitha. You're up, Infotech, he said. I need your eyes cataloging everything my hard asses miss. The concession was unexpected, and Talitha appreciated the note. She replied, It's a life pod. Is it military issue or standard commercial? Drexler was more open with the classified details now that they were standing a snowball's throw from the heart of the mission. This life pod is from a registered commercial transport. It came down 0312 this morning. Talitha interjected, I have a friend in the commercial transport business, back in town. Not interested, masters, Drexler rebutted, now keeping his goggled gaze fixed squarely on the downed escape craft. Onboard weight countershifted with enough force to alter its trajectory three times before hitting the ice here. What was in it? Talitha asked. You're here to vid whatever's left. Talitha recognized that the statement was an order and began her advance. Drexler continued to clarify her business with an ever-increasing voice to cover the distance as she walked. Catalog the forensics. What it all looks like before anybody touches it. She removed a telescoping pole from her shoulder bag, and with a flick of her wrist, snapped it to its full meter and a half length. Attaching a puck-sized sensor to the top of the pole, she thrust it firmly into the snow three meters from the rear of the downed pod. Crossing past the pod's undercarriage toward the front, maintaining equal distance to the first pole's position, she placed her second. She then swung her course around the wedge-tipped front of the pod to place her third pole and sensor. This provided her first view of the open hatch. Ripped asunder would be more apt, as it dangled above the snow, still held on by a single bent and twisted hinge. The smooth outer shielding of the hatch, sufficient to protect its occupant from the furnace heat of re-entry, was mangled with a dozen pockmarks, 
as if whoever or whatever was inside hadn't waited for the mechanism to open automatically, but had smashed it practically off the pod's frame by sheer strength or force of will. Talitha knew nothing organic possessed the raw power to force such an exit. And then there was the shiny, pale, and rust-colored crust frozen to the interior side of the hatch and partially ringing the seal of the opening. Whatever this substance was had been showered onto the ground from within as the hatch had broken. It was frozen now but it had filled two long ruts in the snow that extended from the pod's passenger capsule. Initiating outer scan, Talitha shouted so every member of the squad could hear her. Please stay clear of the triangulation. With a remote control, she turned on the three sensors, which then levitated meters above their base poles bathing the site in a crisscross of thin red, blue, and yellow laser lights, swiftly intercut with secondary orange, green, and purple beams, left to right, up and down, cataloging contour, texture, materials, and radiation from infrared to ultraviolet, and to determine which strata frequency the pod had most recently translated from. Days' worth of computational analytics was collected in seconds. Talitha was thankful that task didn't fall under her job description. She only mixed the data stew. She never had to eat it, and she was certain this batch was going to prove one unappetizing meal once all the ingredients were cooked. The sensors finished their scan and instantly transmitted the data to Talitha's master data crystal. Yet each sensor also kept a backup of their individual scans until everything could be formally downloaded and secured back at the Information Retrieval and Storage Archive. Now it was time to earn her spot on this particular mission. Proceeding to scan the interior, she said, removing her goggles. She lowered a thin, flat targeting screen over both eyes from the helmeted mesh within her parka hood. She raised her vidcam and advanced. A ball of lenses detached from the primary unit and floated before her. The ocular orb synchronized with her screen as its multiple lenses rendered a comprehensive, three-dimensional model of its surroundings. While Talitha could direct its motion with her eyes, combined with the tilt and turn of her head. As one hemisphere of direction projected onto the screen before her, she could raise, lower, or rotate the view, while anything she intently focused upon would zoom the image for even deeper scrutiny. She approached the life pod's hatch with caution as it swung in the steady morning wind gusts, threatening to snap off the hinge under its own weight. Upon closer examination, a rope of some shiny pale substance was revealed as a length of frozen intestine set against the inner side of the hatch by the rusty red crust of what was now obviously blood. Talitha didn't have it in her to be squeamish, but she could still be startled. She steeled herself for a closer examination of the interior and the ocular orb followed her directions inside the target craft. This was a smaller model life pod, designed for three occupants. Most commercial freighters berthed multiple pods scattered across their decks, while ComFed regulations dictated each ship be equipped with one more than the number of licensed crew aboard. This particular pod could have held up to three occupants, whose minced remains were now splattered across every interior surface. Talitha scanned what appeared to be at least three heads, until she realized they were actually three sections of a single head, encrusted with blood and frozen to opposite walls of the pod. Talitha had witnessed the abundant and varied horrors of war, but this was by far the last thing she expected to find. 
The remains had been adhered to their various surfaces before the plunging temperature of desolation had secured them in place, like a macabre work of art. She sensed the approach of Lieutenant Drexler and his sergeant after an appropriate span of time to complete a thorough scan. Talitha had simply gotten lost in the details. She disengaged her link from the orb, then collected it back into the cam unit. She guessed the two scouts were warming themselves inside the transport before making the trek back on their hoverbikes. What could have done this? Talitha asked. Unknown, said Drexler. The sergeant heaved for a moment, one hand to his belly, the other to the outer hull of the pod to steady himself, before abruptly pulling that hand back as he realized what he was touching. Drexler ignored that bit of military unprofessionalism, excusing it as he had the frigid scout's neglect of decorum earlier. But whatever it was, it left tracks, he added. Talitha looked down now, recognizing the ruts in the snow beneath the hatch, filled with puddles of frozen blood, were actually tracks made by whatever had exited the pod with such force. They weren't human. The tracks were as wide as a human foot, but extended a meter in length, seemingly tapering into two long talons, with another shorter single talon at the heel, no doubt for balance. The tracks milled around the open hatch for a few steps, before extending away at an obvious run from the crash site. It didn't take a fauna expert to see that whatever had made the tracks was fast. One of the flash guards approached with a grin, his breath steaming. It looks like we caught a break, Sarge, he said. How's that, muttered the sergeant. He wiped the corner of his mouth with his parka sleeve, leaving a brown smear. The flash guard laughed. There's nothing that wasn't born here that's gonna live through a desolation night. Another approaching flash guard chuckled at the seemingly unassailable logic. But in the privacy of her thoughts, Talitha calculated that it really came down to how swiftly the creature could move, how fast it could run. Talitha's thoughts drifted. Run, but you'll never run far enough. The sun suddenly peeked over the western horizon like a small coin, flaring through the crystals of the fallen snow like a thousand stars. The tracks trailed off toward it, parallel to the path the transport had already covered, toward what minimal warmth this shike planet had to offer. It was headed for redemption. This has been Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces. Book One, Desolation's Tears read by the author. Audio and video production by A.J. Blackburn. Original music composed and performed by Frankie Caffrey. Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces and B.J.L.G.'s Dark Spaces are copyright 2022 by Brian J.L. Glass.